Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Talks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Catherine McLean, a tobacco researcher at George Mason University. TOPS is organized by C. Shang from The Ohio State University, Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco, and Mike Pascoe from Georgia State University and me. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the model will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco, to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our fall 2022 season with a Grand Rounds presentation by Andrea Volanti entitled Randomized Controlled Trials on Nicotine Messaging. Andrea Volanti is Deputy Director of the Rutgers Center for Tobacco Studies and Associate Professor in the Department of Health Behavior, Society and Policy at Rutgers School of Public Health. As a social and behavioral scientist, Dr. Volanti's primary focus is on youth young adult tobacco use including predictors and patterns of use and interventions to reduce tobacco use in young adults. She also has expertise in population surveillance of tobacco and substance use, and translational research to improve substance use related policy and program decision making, including tobacco regulatory science. Her recent work focuses on understanding and reducing misperceptions of nicotine in U.S. adults. Our discussant today is Mike Pesco from Georgia State University. Dr. Angie Volanti, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you, Justin, and thank you all for having me. Um, I'm delighted to share collaborative research that I've been conducting over the past few years um, focused on nicotine messaging, and I've included controlled in parentheses here because I'll be sharing uh, results from two randomized controlled trials and two randomized experiments on the topic. My uh, disclosures are that I have funding from NIH, FDA, and HRSA, and I'll be presenting today on findings from two NIH-funded grants. I have no other financial relationships to disclose, and the content I present today is solely my responsibility um, and does not reflect the official views of NIH or FDA. So one of the most fun things about this topic area for me has been that it has followed the scientific method so closely. So I'm going to share first uh, some of the work that I had done on observational data looking at nicotine misperceptions, um, followed by, uh, you know, the, the goal of finding ways to correct those misperceptions, including educational activities, uh, with the hypothesis that messages with more nuance about nicotine might reduce misperceptions. Uh, I'll then share results from uh, two trials of uh, nicotine messages and the, identify which conditions uh, need to be met for the messages to be effective, and then sort of raise additional questions that have come from the studies that we've conducted about how we can optimize messaging and how, how we can optimize measures. So um, one of the first projects I got involved with after completing my doctorate was the, at that point, Legacy Young Adult Cohort Study, now Truth Initiative Young Adult Cohort Study, where I collaborated really closely with Jessica Rath and others on designing and implementing this multi-wave uh, longitudinal cohort of young adults. And um, during this data collection, uh, the proposed deeming rule and then the final deeming rule were issued by the FDA, bringing all tobacco products under FDA's authority. And importantly, one of the uh, key pieces of this deeming rule was that there needed to be a warning statement on all tobacco products that read, warning, this product contains nicotine, nicotine is an addictive chemical. So sort of straddling this final deeming rule coming out, we included measures on nicotine perceptions in the last two waves of this cohort and received funding um, to conduct secondary analyses of these two um, waves 
from uh, NCI. Now, we weren't the only ones doing this work at the time. There was some great work being done by FDA and folks at UNC looking at beliefs about nicotine and low nicotine cigarettes. And what we hypothesized was that um, the way that people understood nicotine was sort of fell into the way that we would expect um, behavior to follow based on the health belief model. So we thought that perceived susceptibility and severity of both nicotine and tobacco related harm would relate to the threat of that harm and then the likelihood of tobacco use. And we saw the cues to action as a really important piece where we could intervene um, and that FDA could intervene, especially as it related to warning labels and potential public education messaging on nicotine and tobacco products. So our first paper out of this, this um, RO3 was conducted in wave 10 of our uh, Truth Initiative Young Adult Cohort, where we had 4,000 participants who are aged 18 to 40. And what we found was that over half of them believed that nicotine was a cause of cancer. 60% um, believed that a, a cigarette brand low in nicotine was not less addictive than a regular cigarette. And when we asked about the contribution of nicotine to health risks associated with smoking, we found that over 60% believed that um, nicotine was responsible was responsible for the cancer caused by smoking, and sixty six percent reported that um, nicotine was a large part of the health risks of um, cigarette smoking. So my first poll question for you um, is in 2019, approximately what proportion of US adults incorrectly believed that nicotine either caused cancer or were unsure or didn't know? So go ahead and vote now. Okay, let's take a look at the results. So the correct answer is 80%. Uh, so in 2019, the HINTS survey asked, the nicotine in cigarettes is the substance that causes most of the cancer, and 22% uh, disagreed or strongly disagreed with 78% um, agreeing that nicotine caused cancer or reporting don't know. And follow-up poll question, how do you think the proportion of US adults with correct beliefs about nicotine and cancer? So that was, you know, about, um, you know, in 2019, it was about 22%. Uh, said they disagree or strongly disagreed that nicotine caused cancer. How do you think that has changed since the first, first reported estimates in 2015? Have those correct beliefs increased, stayed the same, or decreased? Go ahead and vote. And the results, please. So almost equally split between increased, decreased, and stayed the same. Unfortunately, they have decreased. Um, so in 2015, about 27% of people reported that nicotine does not cause cancer or disagreed with the fact that nicotine caused cancer. It's down to 22% in 2019. So beliefs are moving in the wrong direction. Correct beliefs are moving in the wrong direction. This is pretty consistent with what we've seen about harm perceptions of e-cigarettes, both in the UK and US um, in the past several years. So all of these observational data um, are highlighting these widespread misperceptions of nicotine's role in health harms. And in addition to some of the items I've shared with you, I wanted to just highlight a couple of the other misperceptions that are coming up. Uh, one, nicotine replacement therapy is as harmful to health as smoking. 
Two, e-cigarettes are as or more harmful to health than smoking. And three, reduced nicotine content cigarettes are less harmful than average cigarettes. So this led again to uh, research to think through how could we educate the public uh, to correct nicotine misperceptions. And again, thinking about how much do we need to share? How much nuance can we provide to reduce misperceptions? So this led to a pilot study that we ran with a great team across several institutions um, where we did a brief exposure study to test the effect of a single exposure to nicotine messages on beliefs about nicotine, beliefs about nicotine replacement therapy, e-cigarettes, and reduced nicotine content, or RNC cigarettes. So we exposed people to the messages. We immediately followed it um, with items related to nicotine beliefs and also intention and use of tobacco and nicotine products. And we had two control conditions in this study. One was a sun safety education condition, and one was a no education condition. We enrolled 521 adults age 18 plus on Amazon Mechanical Turk who completed a 15 minute survey um, and received $2.50. Participants completed items on sociodemographics, literacy, and cancer risk behaviors, and then they were randomized in a two to one to one ratio to one of the following three conditions. Uh, half of all participants were exposed to the nicotine education messages, a quarter to the sun safety education messages, which were based on work done by Darren Mays and served as our attention control. And then the third was the no message control condition. The messages that we tested were adapted from several evidence-based sources um, for a lay audience. So we pulled this information for each of the messages from FDA's 2017 comprehensive plan uh, for tobacco and nicotine regulation, from FDA's 2013 modifications to the labeling of NRT products for over-the-counter use, uh, the 2014 Surgeon General's report, and reports on carcinogens from IARC. Uh, all, all of the slides were presented to participants in the intervention condition. They were presented in the same order, and everyone was exposed to each slide for at least five seconds before they could click forward. Um, participants also were asked to click on up to three parts of the image that, uh, that um, attracted their attention. And so you can see the six messages we tested here. Nicotine is the addictive substance in tobacco products. Nicotine makes it easier for people to start smoking regularly. Nicotine makes it harder for people to quit smoking. Nicotine does not cause cancer. Chemicals in cigarette smoke, not nicotine, largely cause cancer, heart disease, and other health problems related to smoking. And nicotine can be used safely long-term in quit smoking products like nicotine patches, gum, or lozenges. Our sun safety education intervention was designed to have a similar format and um, sort of visual interest as the uh, intervention condition. So you can see here the messages that we used related to um, sun safety and skin cancer. And again, they, these were drawn from Darren Mays' work in this area. When we looked at our results um, between the two control conditions, we found there was really no difference um, between the sun safety or no message intervention control. Uh, and so we combined those in comparison to the intervention condition. And what we saw was that the people who were exposed to the nicotine messaging intervention reported fewer false beliefs um, about nicotine as a cause of cancer and about the health risks associated with nicotine. When we looked at this across multiple products, we had, again, these, these scales of false beliefs related to nicotine, NRT, e-cigarettes, and reduced nicotine content cigarettes. We found a similar pattern whereby exposure to the intervention reduced false beliefs um, compared to the control conditions. 
So we published this paper in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, and this served as pilot data for an R01 submission that Andrew Strasser and I led uh, that has um, that takes a, a parallel study approach where we have a population-based trial in US adults, and then we have a lab-based trial in adults who smoke cigarettes and receive either low or normal nicotine content cigarettes. So I, I have led the first population-based trial and Andrew is leading the second lab-based study. And both studies use a common um, framework where we have uh, baseline measures collected, then participants are exposed in the intervention condition are exposed uh, for the first time. Then we assess the outcomes at about one month follow-up and then we have uh, two more exposures to the messages. We assess the outcomes. And then our, our control condition is a delayed message um, control condition. So then everyone is exposed to the messaging and we collect information on both the perceived effectiveness and the credibility of the messages. So I'm gonna focus um, today on the findings our, for our primary outcomes. Uh, from the AIM-1 study. So again, the goal of this population trial was to test the impact of nicotine corrective messaging on nicotine beliefs and on the subsequent impact on intention and use of tobacco and nicotine products in adult smokers and non-smokers, more of a general population sample. And these people were followed for 12 weeks. So we recruited 794 English-speaking adults age 18 plus from NORC's Amerispeak panel. Um, panelists who are 18 plus were, received an email invitation describing the study and interested panel members were directed to the initial baseline survey. Data collection happened between February of 2021 and May of 2021. Um, so participants who were interested came into the baseline survey, completed the baseline survey, and at the end of that survey were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio to either the nicotine corrective messaging intervention or delayed message control condition. And we had approximately 400 people in each condition. Um, at the end of the uh, baseline survey, Participants in the intervention condition got their first exposure to the study messages. We then at wave two collected the key outcome measures. And again, participants in the intervention condition were exposed to the messages. Then only the intervention condition got the third exposure. And then at the fourth wave, um, the key measures were collected and then the fourth exposure occurred. You can see we had pretty good retention over time. Um, about 74% in our intervention condition, about 80% in our control condition at the wave four follow-up. So our stimuli for this study included the six messages that we had tested in the pilot and then two additional messages in response to reviewer comments during our grant, um, grant writing process. So the first message was related to e-cigarettes e-cigarettes may expose users to significantly lower amounts of toxic substances than regular cigarettes, but they can contain as much or more nicotine. And then one message on low nicotine cigarettes. Low nicotine cigarettes are as harmful as regular cigarettes, but they may help people quit and prevent new users from becoming addicted to cigarettes. So again, participants saw all eight of these messages in the same order, um, in the order that they're presented here, and they had to uh, stay on the slide for up to five seconds, and they also completed the heat mapping uh, exercise. Our, based on the findings from our pilot study, we had a delayed message control condition, as I mentioned, um, because we had no difference between either the attention control or the no message control condition in the pilot. So our primary outcomes consisted of those nicotine, NRT, e-cigarette, and reduced nicotine content cigarette false beliefs items. Um, our secondary outcomes were intention to use nicotine or tobacco products and nicotine or tobacco use behavior. 
You can see here on the slide uh, the way that we have mapped out the two aims of the study to have comparable measures being collected at similar times um, across both the population and lab-based study. So our analysis uh, looked at both the bivariate um, differences in the dif distribution of demographic characteristics by study condition and the primary outcomes by study condition at wave four. Uh, and then we also used linear regression models to examine the differences in false belief scores for those four products by study condition at waves two and four, and then conducted exploratory analyses to look at the effect of dose um, on the wave four false beliefs, with dose being uh, measured or I guess categorized as how many times a participant had been exposed to our messages uh, between zero, which was the control condition, and three times, which was the maximum before the outcome measures were assessed. So great news was that we saw no difference in the distribution of demo demographic characteristics by study conditions, you know, giving us more confidence that the randomization worked and that our two conditions were comparable. Our primary outcomes at wave four, when we looked at the mean, um, mean uh, false belief scales for each product, we saw that our, our crude analyses showed that there was only a difference in NRT false beliefs and the e-cigarette false beliefs compared to the control condition. So we saw reductions in false beliefs about NRT and e-cigarettes um, in the intervention group. When we looked at what was happening in wave two and wave four among people who were who completed both um, of those surveys, wave two and wave four surveys, we saw that there was actually greater change in beliefs at wave four follow-up than wave two follow-up when we were controlling for the baseline false beliefs um, in the in each person. So you can see that the the red um, estimates are a little farther from the null uh, compared to the blue estimates, which are at wave two. So this led us to look at dose um, as the exposure variable. So control participants were categorized as zero, um, receiving the, the messages zero times. And then we had either one, two, or three potential exposures in the intervention condition. And what we saw was a pretty consistent pattern that for each of the scales, the false belief scales, we saw the greatest reductions in false beliefs in the intervention group compared to the control group at three doses um, of the message. So this led us to think more about the conditions under which the messages were effective. So we had seen that the brief nicotine uh, corrective messaging can reduce nicotine misperceptions after a single exposure. But when we looked at, um, and that really related to this kind of box I've shown here in our, in our broader trial, it would relate to this exposure one and outcomes box. But that in our broader trial, our multiple exposure trial, we required um, three exposures to the messages to reduce nicotine perceptions. And that raised a question for us, why is there this difference between the brief, the single brief exposure and the multiple exposures? And that largely relates to the designs of the two studies. So in our brief exposure trial, we exposed participants to the messages and then immediately we assessed the outcomes, the nicotine beliefs and intention and use of nicotine and tobacco products. And in the multiple exposure trials, it was set up a little bit differently. So we had baseline measures taken, and then there was an exposure. Then there was up to a four week gap um, where we assessed the outcomes and then exposed them a second time. Then we had another third exposure, and then we assessed the outcomes after that point. So in the brief exposure trial, exposure and outcome assessment were separated by seconds and maybe minutes at the most. 
And in our multiple exposure trial, our exposure and outcome assessment was separated by at the least one week and at the most four weeks um, at each wave. Additionally, we assessed ba beliefs at baseline in the multiple exposure trial, um, which may have primed participants in some way, though we won't be able to really assess that at this point. So as we have the rollout of um, a, a reduced nicotine content cigarette in the commercial market, um, and as FDA has proposed a nicotine reduction uh, policy, we know that the extent to which um, that the public health impact of these uh, of this proposal really hinges on the extent to which people understand the harms of nicotine in relationship to specific products, and that includes NRT, and it includes reduced nicotine content cigarettes and e-cigarettes and other um, forms of nicotine that are available. Our results suggest that corrective messaging about nicotine can reduce nicotine risk perceptions, including those related to e-cigarettes, NRT, and reduced nicotine content cigarettes, but that population level efforts will require multiple campaign exposures to achieve reductions in false beliefs. Now, a major limitation of the work that we've done th thus far is that even if we change beliefs, we know little about how nicotine corrective messaging will impact uptake or use of the products that we're measuring, included, including reduced nicotine content cigarettes, e-cigarettes, or NRT. So this is a, a, a bit a uh, more expanded image of something that I shared earlier um, related to our R01 study. And what you can see here is I had shared the top that shows the parallel design of what we're collecting in both studies and the design in both studies. And what's below is the differences between the population trial and the lab-based trial in which we're actually getting at behavior, use, and subjective ratings of the product. So our ongoing AIM-2 lab-based study um, is testing the interaction of the nicotine corrective messages and exposure to reduced nicotine content cigarettes. So we have 160 participants who are randomized to one of the four, the four cells below where they are either receiving nicotine corrective messaging or delayed message control. And they are either receiving normal nicotine content cigarettes or reduced nicotine content cigarettes. One piece that's different here um, in comparison to what has been done uh, in the many trials that have been run on reduced nicotine content cigarettes is that we're actually telling people what they are getting. So they know that they're getting a reduced nicotine content cigarette or a normal nicotine content cigarette, um, and they're receiving the corrective messaging that may impact, give us a sense, a real world estimate of um, what might happen in the context of an educational campaign. So I'll pause here for any questions. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I think we will first turn to our discussant, Mike Pesco, to see if he has comments or questions for you. Great, uh, Andrea, thanks so much for uh, this really interesting um, uh, presentation. Um, I might have missed it, but I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more about um, the delayed message control condition. Um, and as I understand it, I think some people, they were in a control where they didn't get any kind of nicotine corrective messaging, but they might then in subsequent uh, waves have then received some kind of uh, exposure. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how that randomization occurred. Sure, so um, uh, I'm gonna share a bit more about that piece right after this, uh, but basically people uh, in, the, uh, in the control condition did not see anything until after the final outcome measures were assessed. And then everyone saw the messages. So intervention and control participants all saw the messages at wave four. Uh, and then we assessed message response at that point. Okay. Um, and um, I know that you're uh, not sharing much about the, um, the, the lab-based work and uh, the uh, people's actual use of um, a, a tobacco, but I was curious if, if you guys are um, including nicotine replacement therapy products then as uh, one of those products to assess whether this nicotine corrective messaging changes people's 
uh, willingness to, to use those products or use yeah. of those products? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. So we are collecting that information. We're collecting message, we're collecting um, use behavior in a more detailed way in that, uh, in that study. Um, and um, in addition to like use of the, the study products that we're providing them, the normal or reduced nicotine content cigarettes, we are assessing their use of other products at each follow-up. Um, but we are not giving them NRT in this, uh, in the lab-based study. We're giving them um, normal or reduced nicotine content cigarettes. Okay. Um, and I, it was interesting that um, with the uh, RCT, I think you had about 15% uh, cigarette users. Um, uh, I imagine that just looking across all nicotine or tobacco products, it would be even higher. Um, I guess I, I was immediately curious if there's any differences in kind of the um, effect of the nicotine corrective messaging on tobacco product users versus um, non-users. Um, and then it started getting me thinking about other demographics that maybe might be more or less responsive to that kind of messaging. I don't know if you can share anything about that. At this yeah, point. so we have looked at um, a few potential moderators, uh, including literacy, um, uh, past 30 day tobacco use, um, and uh, one a, a, a newer one, which is concern about addiction to nicotine. And what we saw was that there was really no difference um, by uh, in in past thirty day tobacco users versus non users on any of the uh, on nicotine false beliefs, on NRT false beliefs, on e cigarette false beliefs. But there was some difference on reduced nicotine content, cigarette false beliefs, and it was sort of a similar pattern across the moderators that we looked at. So we're definitely looking more into that. Um, it has been interesting just to see in what groups um, these messages and particularly individual messages um, are, are having a greater impact. And I'll share more on that in a minute. Okay. Those are all my questions. Thank you. All right. Great. So uh, we do have a, a few questions from the audience that um, we'll, we'll try to get to. So one is from Norbert Zeltron Schmidt asking, um, this is related to the nicotine corrective messaging. Why does one of the six pictures have a picture of a cigarette, but the others don't? And uh, he commented that it looked like a blunt to him rather than a cigarette. So um, if you could. So um, I, we included the one picture on cigarettes in the um, specific image that was describing cigarettes, so chemicals in cigarette smoke. There is actually a cigarette in that image. Um, it, it, I do see the white paper in the filter, but totally understand it could be misperceived as a blunt. Um, so that was one reason for doing that. Okay. Um, and this question is from Mike Cummings. Um, do you think correcting false beliefs might be easier in interventions where cigarette smokers are given a lower risk nicotine product, such as e-cigarettes, new oral nicotine products, et cetera? That was our thought too, Mike. And we are looking into it um, right now in the lab to in the lab based study. Okay, great. Uh, from Akshika Sharma, was a, was baseline information about prior experience with e-cigarettes or VLNCs obtained? Yes. So we and did we assess um, baseline use of multiple different tobacco products. At the point where we conducted this survey, there was not a commercially available low nicotine cigarette. Um, so I, I know that we have that at follow-up, um, but I'm not sure that we have that at our baseline data. Okay. Um, from Cheryl Olson, uh, do you have thoughts on uh, which people might be seen as credible messengers to give corrective information um, on nicotine, for example, organizations, media outlets, or individuals? I think that's a great question. Um, and I think that is something that we need to do more research on. Uh, you know, our work has largely focused on the public education uh, authority of FDA and the, the role that FDA should play in um, addressing nicotine misperceptions. But I think there's been a lot of confusion in the media recently about nicotine. And so uh, finding credible sources, I think, will be a really important part of the work, the uh, dissemination work moving forward. And from C. Shang, how are don't know or unsure um, considered in the belief outcomes? 
So in our belief outcomes, they are they are placed at the midpoint of the of the scale. So um, strongly agree, agree, don't know is uh, a three, and then uh, disagree, strongly disagree. Okay, great. Um, if uh, if we have, there's a couple more questions in the queue, but we'll come back to them at the end if there's time. So you can okay. feel free to keep going. Great, great questions. Thank you all. So um, as Mike asked, you know, how did we treat this last delayed message control condition? And so what you can see here is that at the end of collecting our main outcome measures, we exposed everyone to the nicotine messaging the same way that we had done throughout. So everyone uh, saw all messages, they had to watch them for at least five seconds, and they had to do the heat mapping exercise to click on the parts of the image that uh, attracted their attention. After they were exposed, we assessed perceived message effectiveness and credibility of the, mes of the message um, using three items. Our perceived effect message effectiveness measure came from work done by Seth Knorr and others at UNC, and we adapted it for um, to address nicotine. And largely, the, a higher score on uh, perceived message effectiveness related to discouraging nicotine use. So people viewing um, the message as um, uh, increasing maybe perceived harm of nicotine. So we uh, found that our intervention condition who saw these messages up to three times and our control condition who saw these messages only one time during the study, there was no difference between the two. So the repeated exposures to the message uh, versus single exposure did not impact message response. We saw similar uh, perceived message effectiveness in the intervention and control conditions. Um, and similar mean scores for the message being perceived as accurate, authentic, or believable. Um, and so this was sort of an interesting finding. And again, led us to think about what, how these, we, we all of these, these two studies to, to this point looked at all of these messages in a single campaign and did not disaggregate how individual messages were performing. Um, and importantly, in uh, campaign development, formative research efforts, um, perceived message effectiveness and message effects um, are largely used to determine whether a campaign is likely to perform the way we want it to in, uh, in a population setting. And so on a scale from one to five, if the messages are performing above the midpoint, that's a good indication that they, they might perform well in the, um, in the public. But again, this is sort of an interesting measure here because we're looking at um, the messages discouraging, like the, the way that the messages are potentially discouraging nicotine use. So two additional experiments that we've conducted. Um, one was conducted in May of 2020 in about 3,000 uh, 18 to 45 year olds in the US through MTurk. And the goal of this was to really pull apart our messaging intervention and test individual messages against each other. Uh, and so we were interested in message response using similar items that we had used in our trial and potential impact of the individual messages on nicotine and reduced nicotine content cigarette beliefs. So we started with our eight messages that were used in the R01, AIM-1 trial and AIM-2 trial. Um, we then included six VLN messages that had been authorized for marketing by the FDA and 12 messages from FDA's From Plant to Product to Puff education campaign. Um, so participants were randomized to receive one of the 26 messages. Everything was just a text-based message. There was no graphic or imagery associated with it. And then participants completed the three-item scale of perceived message effectiveness, and then this, a single item on nicotine beliefs which was the item um, nicotine is a cause of cancer, true, false, don't know, and then six items assessing reduced nicotine content cigarette beliefs. Um, 
And those items related to um, cigarettes, lower in nicotine, being less likely to cause cancer, being safer, being healthier, having fewer chemicals, um, being less addictive, and making it easier to quit smoking compared with regular cigarettes. We had um, about 100 to 124 participants randomized to each message condition. So again, 26 messages tested, 100 to 124 people seeing um, one of those messages. And then we looked at the relationships between mean perceived effectiveness and that nicotine and reduced nicotine cigarette beliefs. And we also looked at um, the way that individual messages were impacting nicotine and RNC cigarette beliefs in the full sample. So one of the interesting findings we had was that when we looked in the full sample across all messages, a one unit increase in mean perceived effectiveness was correlated with higher odds of a false belief about nicotine. And if we think about that, a message that has higher perceived message effectiveness is discouraging nicotine use and potentially making uh, the increasing the perceived harm of nicotine. And that is leading to higher false beliefs about nicotine causing cancer. When we looked at the measures related to reduced nicotine content cigarettes, um, there was no relationship between mean perceived message effectiveness and false beliefs about reduced nicotine content cigarettes. But when we broke the groups out and we looked at um, people who smoked cigarettes and people who did not smoke cigarettes, we saw it was correlated with greater false beliefs um, about RNC cigarettes in current cigarette smokers. So this kind of led us to think about um, and has raised questions for us on what are the appropriate measures of um, uh, message effectiveness or message response that will help us get to more accurate beliefs um, and, and potentially the measures that we're using right now, which really relate to um, our, you know, does this discourage you from using nicotine? Does this make you not want to try use, using nicotine? Like those types of messages, uh, those types of measures are um, are correlated in with with false beliefs. So that's moving in the in a direction we did not expect. When we looked at the individual message effects, we found that out of our twenty six messages, five of the candidate messages increased the odds of a correct belief about nicotine and cancer, and one message, only one message, substantively increased correct beliefs about reduced nicotine content cigarettes. Um, you can see here the top five um, items, the top five messages, uh, two, one was from our R01, um, three were from authorized messages for VLN, and one was from FDA's campaign. Um, and then the only message that increased false, increased correct beliefs about reduced nicotine content cigarettes was from our R01. And that message was um, the unique message that we developed for low nicotine content cigarettes. So we then, uh, you know, we're interested in, well, okay, we have, uh, we can see what these different, um, how these different messages are performing, but we also need to get a sense of how our measures are performing. And so if our main outcome measure is related to nicotine and cancer, um, consistent with other uh, surveys that are being conducted in the field, how do those measures compare to each other? So this was a measures experiment that we just ran in August of this year in 2,500 um, 18 to 45 year olds in the US. And our goal here was to understand how the survey item itself affected the prevalence of nicotine perceptions. And some of this work built on um, work conducted by our colleagues, including Michelle Bovermanderski, um, in, in comparing uh, in this study two different measures of nicotine causing cancer uh, among US physicians. So in this study, we used 
The two items um, in the Bover Mandursky paper, we used the hints item on nicotine causing cancer that I shared earlier in the poll. We used a path measure on nicotine and cancer, um, other, other um, measures from our research, and then we developed a few novel items to test in this survey as well. So 10 items all addressing the role of nicotine and cancer. And after participants saw one of those 10 items, they then completed an open-ended cognitive interview question about their response. So we had 10 conditions, um, about 2,500 participants, so between 240 and 267 responded to each item. Uh, and within this study, we had three embedded experiments. Uh, we are interested in how response options affected um, the prevalence of misperceptions or correct beliefs. Uh, so we had the hints item with and without the don't know um, option. And we're also interested in our own item, nicotine is a cause of cancer, with true false don't know versus a Likert scale of agreement like used in hints. We also had the question from the Bover Mandursky paper, with, that was a difference in the stem of the question. Nicotine directly contributes to the development of cancer versus nicotine on its own directly contributes to the development of cancer. And our analyses examined the prevalence of correct beliefs by study condition. So I'll leave this on for a minute. This is uh, the range of items that we tested. What you can see here in the top row in the third row and in the fourth row are the embedded experiments that we had. Um, so we had 10 items total, uh, and these are all of the items that we tested in this survey. What we found is that survey item influences prevalence. Um, and I want to credit Justin Byron with the way that um, he and his team presented uh, similar findings in their, in their study. Um, so this basically showed that the prevalence of correctly believing that nicotine does not cause cancer ranged from about 10% based on one item up to 81% um, based on an item that said just the nicotine in, can in cigarettes causes cancer. So a couple pieces here. Generally, the hints and path items produced higher prevalence of correct beliefs in this sample. So in the 40s, 43.8 uh, up to 49.6, compared with um, the U.S. prevalence, the 2019 numbers are, you know, around 22 percent. Other items that we used aligned more closely with the U.S. prevalence estimates, and those included nicotine directly contributes to the development of cancer, nicotine is a cause of cancer, and nicotine is a cause of cancer with the Likert scale. In our, um, at our extremes, I've included a couple of quotes from uh, the open-ended responses that we received. So um, in the lowest category, the fewest false, the fewest correct beliefs about nicotine and cancer, a couple of quotes here. Uh, I believe nicotine is a carcinogen which can damage the body and cause cancer. I was in a DARE program growing up and I think everyone knows that nicotine causes cancer. At the other end, uh, the 80% with correct beliefs, there are many other ingredients in cigarettes that are harmful to those who smoke them. The smoke also contributes to cancer. It obviously is not good for your lungs. I actually don't know how nicotine contributes to cancer. And the results from our embedded experiment, also interesting, we did see a significant difference in the hints item when we included versus excluded the don't know condition, the don't know response option. So we had a greater proportion with correct beliefs when we forced the choice and removed the don't know option. In the second embedded experiment, we were using our own survey item with the true false don't know option versus a Likert scale of agreement. Um, and what you can see here is there was no difference in the proportion with correct beliefs about nicotine and cancer 
uh, regardless of those response options. And then the third um, was the two items that talked about nicotine directly causes cancer and nicotine on its own, I'm sorry, nicotine directly contributes to the development of cancer and nicotine on its own directly contributes. And you can see here that there is a more than 10% difference in the proportion uh, reporting uh, correct beliefs about nicotine. This is consistent with the earlier findings in physicians um, suggesting that including the phrase on its own may reduce misperceptions about nicotine's role in cancer. So all of this work has really led me to uh, more questions than answers. Uh, this has been an amazing uh, set of studies where I think we're about to just start back on the observation question and go around again. I would love to hear any recommendations or suggestions you have for moving this work forward. Also happy to answer any questions and thank you for being here today. Thanks. Um, maybe we can then turn to Mike Pesco, our discussant again, to uh, read us off. Uh, yeah, thanks again. Thanks again, Andrea. Um, so I guess just kind of a, a, con a conceptual question. Um, uh, I, I sparked by the, the comment about the DARE program growing up. Um, is, there any, is there any way that we could think about taking some of the, um, some of the, the findings that you have and in, in not necessarily doing nicotine corrective messaging, but improving existing um, uh, anti-tobacco efforts to try to reshape kind of the messaging around them so that people aren't taking away necessarily wrong messages about nicotine. Do you have any yeah, thoughts I, on just that general idea? Yes, I love that idea. And I think, um, you know, all this whole topic really lends itself more to a longer conversation and a nuanced conversation than a sound bite. And I think a lot of the messaging that we've done at this point has really been a sound bite. And we've been, you know, giving a single message to young people about um, nicotine and, and particularly with respect to vaping. Um, so I think, I think there is room and this is you know, the work that we're doing, we see as sort of on a continuum of public education that would happen um, in prevention efforts and in cessation efforts. Uh, and so the ways in which we can kind of keep all of these messages together, I think will help um, with public understanding of a really complex topic. Okay, I, I will uh, pass it back off to, to Justin then, because I see we have quite a few audience questions. Thank you. Sure. Um, so one question is from uh, Dale Manti that, who asks, with don't know being coded as three, um, were there any tests conducted to determine if that coding was psychometrically valid? So we have... Um based a lot of this work on, uh, on Andrew Strasser and Melissa Merson Cavage's work. They have done sort of validation of this instrument, um, but that's certainly, we have also looked at um, pulling out the don't know option and trying to understand how are the people that respond don't know um, different from other people in the sample? And that's other work that Andrew and his team are doing. So that is a great question and something that we continue to look at. And uh, this is uh, from Cheryl Olson. Uh, do you plan to do any qualitative work to understand the nature of nicotine beliefs, um, including where they come from and how deeply they're, uh, they're held? And I know you sort of presented a few quotes uh, during this, but maybe you can say some more about that. Yeah, so that's a great question. And we're just dipping our toe in now with the, uh, the open-ended responses that we have. They're kind of cognitive interviewing question, um, but we are doing coding. So we have you know, 2,500 open-ended responses, and we're trying to develop a more um, efficient way to code those 2,500 responses. And then, yes, I do hope to do more qualitative work, um, and especially to kind of tease apart how the messages that we're that we have uh, been using, the messages that we would propose to use, messages that are approved by. Um, that sorry, not approved, authorized by FDA. How how do people understand those messages? And how can we tweak them to uh, be more effective? 
Uh, so uh, that's great. Uh, another question from Norbert Ziltron Schmidt asking about uh, since misperceptions about nicotine are also uh, strong among health workers, um, should they also be uh, part of the people who we are uh, targeting for interventions? Yes. Uh, and colleagues of mine are working on that right now. Um, so we're we definitely see that as another population that will need some corrective messaging. Okay. Um, Shanika Rose says, uh, how do you think about understanding the equity implications of these products coming on the market and the policies? And how do we avoid unintended consequences for those who may already experience tobacco related disparities? Yeah, that's a great question, Shanika. And we're like tracking where VLN is showing up. Um, it's only been showing up in a few markets. I think there's still ongoing work understanding how um, nicotine pouch products and other products are uh, sort of spatially distributed, where they're showing up, in what markets are they showing up, in what neighborhoods are they showing up. So I, I think that's a really important thing for us to keep tracking um, because really the population level impact and is, is going to be related to access to these products and access to the education and thinking through how do we, um, how do we make sure that people a, are educated, and B, if they, um, current smokers, have access to, to products to quit, including uh, NRT. So one question I had uh, was, uh, and you can correct my misunderstanding, is thinking about the single exposure sun safety pilot versus the sort of uh, bigger uh, two-arm multi-exposure population study. It seemed like in that uh, the, the effect size was smaller in that two-arm trial. And so part of this was you were saying that there's sort of this delay in terms of when uh, from when you were measuring. But I, I wasn't exactly clear, like, what do we take away from that? That people, like, they, they sort of absorb the implications at the time, but then sort of forget about um, the, that or, or sort of what's going on? Or, or is it about sort of like uh, um, trying trying to, uh, what's the word, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, I'm like basically uh, what the what the researcher wants to hear, like a social desirability <laughs> thing, or what, what's going on here. Yeah, so I think uh, I think there's a couple things that could be happening, and I that's a good point. The social desirability piece. I think just the proximity. Um, you know, you've exposed people to these messages, and they are being asked to respond kind of directly. Uh, they're asked to pay attention to the messages in a certain way, and then they're asked to respond to these items that are pretty directly relevant to the messages that they were just exposed to. Um, so it's not all that surprising that we would see um, a larger effect in that in that setting. But it was surprising to us, I think, that we didn't that you know we powered our our um, our R01 based on the larger effect that we saw in that pilot study, as many of us do when we are writing grants, um, and we saw a smaller effect. But I think it also relates to the way that public education campaigns are conducted, where you're expecting that people are exposed to a certain level of that uh, of your messaging over time, and that it takes time. It takes, and that's why the minimum um, re recommended period is 12 weeks for an intervention, and why we uh, conducted our study over 12 weeks was um, that you're expecting people to be exposed over 12 weeks and then over time you expect that awareness of your campaign messaging to increase and to have an impact on your outcomes and so consistent with other um, national campaigns evaluations generally aren't conducted for uh, you know months to years after the campaign has been in the field and there has been adequate awareness reached so that could be part of it's taking us three times um, to get to that level where uh, you know, without immediate exposure, people can recall what the messages were saying and can and and have changed their beliefs at that point. I'm going to try to sneak in one one more quick question. Um, would it this from Mike Cummings? Uh, might it help if FDA get, might give clear messaging about the relative risks of different types of tobacco products, which vary in harm, but not so much on nicotine? Yeah, I think we need to have some sort of agreement in the field. Um, and and ideally, uh, you know, uh, presented across our 
uh, national education campaigns and by FDA and by researchers um, where we describe the potential harms of different products uh, and, and like you said, Mike, not, not necessarily tied to the level of nicotine in the product. Thanks so much for a great presentation. Catherine, do you wanna take us out? Yes, and thanks so much for that really wonderful presentation. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 165 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend.